from WRAL News, this is Focal Point. 911 emergency. Hello, I'd like to report a case of abuse. They see the victim, whether she's a girlfriend or a wife, as their property. If I can't have her, no one can. It's sort of a common refrain. Yeah, my husband just hit me over the head with a coil of computer wires. They understand that violence in the home is wrong, but what they've got to do is in their mind, they've got to have justification for their action. What's the best way for them to justify it? Well, here's a protective order that sh she took out. You have the nerve to call the cops on me. I'll tell you one thing. You think you're calling up this wedding. You're wrong. I'll kill you first. I'll find you. You ruined my life. You're dead. So essentially, he's been given a pink slip. You know, you're fired from this relationship, or I'm leaving, or I can't do this anymore. What is the matter with you people? What do I have to do? Am I going to end up dead or somebody? Or am I going to have to kill somebody and get the f out of here? They are not a guarantee of safety. They're not. Please help me. They are effective only if the defendant is capable of, of self restraint. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> Anybody that is made their mind up and is determined to kill you is going to kill you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Shut fire to my house. Shut fire to my house. Oh my God. Since 2002, more than 300 people in North Carolina have been murdered by someone who supposedly loved them. Most of the victims were women, killed by a husband or boyfriend. And in many of the cases, the killer was under a domestic violence protective order, what's commonly called a restraining order. Our focal point, that paper-thin promise that's supposed to protect victims of domestic violence. We begin with a look at one of many cases in our state, where it did not. Anitra Coburn was blonde and bubbly. She loved animals and elderly people. She was alive. I mean, she was just full of life. In 1995, Anitra met Doug Carter. She was only 19. He was 32. After just a couple of dates, he talked Anitra into moving in with him. That was a red flag. Over the next year, Carter became increasingly possessive. He built a privacy fence around their deck to keep neighbors from seeing Anitra sunbathing. He went door to door, introduced himself, and told them that if I catch you looking at my girlfriend laying out in the sun, I will kill you. Carter went from possessive to abusive, at one point locking Anitra in a closet and he barricaded the door shut while he built a cage around the waterbed. And then when he was through with the cage, he put her in the waterbed and she stayed there for three days. He wasn't gonna let her go. I guess he was gonna try to convince her that he was, you know, he was the answer for her or that she couldn't ever leave. And, when Anitra escaped out of a bathroom window, Carter caught her in the cul-de-sac and pushed her to the ground. Someone called 911 and Pitt County deputies responded. Anitra told them how Carter held her captive, hit her in the head with the butt of a gun, and forced her to write a suicide note at gunpoint. You just knew what she was saying was the truth. It hit you right in the gut. I mean, you just knew. Deputies charged Carter with felonious assault and kidnapping. Carter convinced Anitra's grandparents to post his bond. Anitra got a restraining order to keep Carter away, but he staked out the house where she was staying and waited for her to come out alone. And he came out of the woods with a gun and fired off some rounds and got into the car with her. Carter kidnapped Anitra and eventually took her to her grandparents' trailer in Franklin County. Her grandparents showed up there two weeks later and found themselves looking down the barrel of Doug Carter's gun. They called for help and deputies responded. And when they were getting ready to go inside, they heard a, a woman say, please go away, he's got a gun to my head, and if you come in, he will kill me. They saw a hand with a gun pointed to the woman's head. They saw her, of course. They backed out. They, they called the SBI for assistance. 
The SBI positioned snipers around the trailer and called in hostage negotiators who tried to talk with Carter. Okay, and um, moving up right now. Huh? They're moving over there now. He was very unstable. He was very belligerent, verbally abusive. And then at other times he was re reasonably calm and coherent and it sounded like that he wanted to negotiate. It was it was just a roller coaster ride. Negotiators also tried to talk with Anitra. Anitra, you there? Yes. So is everything going like you want? I hope so. She was very scared. We heard her crying a lot. Sometimes she was reasonably calm. She pleaded with negotiators throughout this ordeal for not to let the police come into the trailer because if they did, he would kill her instantly. Anitra spent her 20th birthday as a hostage. I could just imagine her sitting there tied up hands and legs on a leash on a table. And she's sitting there and she's watching this man that she at one time thought she loved. She's watching him completely lose his humanity. If he heard somebody coming too close, he would st stick the gun out, a shotgun, and shoot, shoot out into the field. And then he would threaten us and say if, if we came any closer, he would kill her. He threatened to kill her many times throughout the ordeal. An ordeal that became the longest standoff in SBI history. But as long as Anitra was alive, negotiators had hope. There's a thousand things that could go wrong and only one thing that could go right. And you have to keep plugging for that one thing to go right. Eventually, Carter accepted a promise from the SBI that he would not be harmed if he surrendered and that he would be taken to Dorothea Dix Hospital. Carter told the SBI he had to disconnect explosives he claimed he had attached to the door. Watching all you people out there. Uh huh. Give me a couple minutes. I got to uh, disconnect the wires. I don't have no problem with them. Hey, I hope, hey. I hope you don't have any problem with me, but you please be very careful, okay? Okay. Hey, I've come this far, I don't want anything to happen to you, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll call you back after I get. Okay, Nietzsche, you okay? Anitra, yeah. are you okay? I'm trying to be. Hey, it, it's all downhill from now, okay? Okay, and, and I'll call you back. We could hear him inside the trailer taking the barricades from off from the inside. Everything seemed to be going well. We heard Anitra, she sounded very calm. She was very happy. And then, in a, in a matter of seconds, everything changed. Anitra tried to escape out a back window, and Carter fired a small caliber pistol at her, grazing her in the head. She knew she wasn't going out the front door. She knew it. Hello? What's the matter? What's the matter? Doug? Doug? It just tore my whole world apart. She was the only thing that I was connected to. Um, she was my only blood relative. After he shot Anitra in the head with a shotgun, Carter put the gun under his chin and pulled the trigger. That's a shot. That is a shot. That is a shot. Hello? Hello? Next, why did a court order fail to protect Anitra Coburn from Doug Carter? It didn't mean anything to me. Nothing. He was hell-bent to kill her. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. A domestic violence protective order didn't protect Anitra Coburn. And all too often, they fail to protect other victims of domestic violence. To understand why, it may help to look at what motivates abusers, like Doug Carter. As an advocate for victims of domestic violence, Kit Gruel can speak from experience. Her first husband abused her for years. He would put his hands around my throat every day and squeeze and lift me up off the ground and say to me, if you ever try to leave, I will hunt you down and I will kill you. Gruel understands the dynamics of the Anitra Coburn case. 
She was his property, and if he couldn't have her, no one could. And that's the bottom line for these offenders, is they obsess about the victims, they see them as their property, they have a strong sense of entitlement, and, and they are absolutely determined to maintain complete power and control over the victim. Abusers were often in abusive homes as children. That was the case with Doug Carter. It's become normalized behavior for them, and this is just the way they relate to their partners because they've seen their mom get beaten up by their dad or by the boyfriend or the stepfather or whatever. Abusers find ways to justify violence. It's going to occur whether you have the protective order or not. They just won't use that justification. They'll justify it in some other way. Maybe you spent too much money yesterday at the store. Uh, maybe you told me you would be home at uh, 6.30 last night and you got home at 7.30. I think the part that's the most frustrating for me is hearing people that are on the outside say, well, if it was me, I'd just leave. People say that without realizing that the most dangerous thing for a battered woman to do is to leave the relationship. The risk of her being murdered by her abuser increases by 75% when she leaves the relationship. Victims know the risk. Abusers use their fear to manipulate them. They'll try to manipulate the victims, law enforcement, and the courts, and society as well. Doug Carter had befriended Anitra's grandparents and convinced them to use their land in Franklin County to post his bond. That very piece of land that she died on is the land that got him out of jail. Yeah. When Anitra went to court to get a protective order, she had no legal representation. Carter had an attorney who put a statement in the order saying there was no evidence of abuse. Advocates can understand how that may have happened. She's 19 years old. She knows very little about the justice system. An attorney comes up to her and basically presents her with a piece of paper. Here you go. If you sign this, he'll agree to stay away from you. If you sign this, you're not going to get put on the witness stand. If you sign this, we're not going to delve into your past. We're not going to embarrass you in front of all of these people. Sign right here. Like other victims seeking protective orders, Anitra had to face her abuser in court, knowing the order could just make matters worse. There's no doubt in my mind she was, she was fearful of him, but she's also fearful of taking the stand. Do you think sometimes these restraining orders make the abuser more angry? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Gruel and other advocates say protective orders are effective in most cases, and they urge victims to get them. The restraining orders are useful in that it is a public declaration of fear. It's a request for help from the criminal justice system. But if a restraining order can't protect all victims, what will? Until as a society we start to take steps, until as a society we start to say we're not going to tolerate this anymore, the deaths are going to keep coming and there is going to be blood on people's hands. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. There are some new approaches being tried to help make domestic violence protective orders more effective. Some are innovative, some controversial, but many say real change will only come if society changes its mindset about domestic violence. You are charged with an offense, I believe, assault on a female. In Pitt County, many defendants charged with domestic violence are put under electronic house arrest as a condition of bond. All right, good luck to you, sir. Their ankle bracelets communicate with global positioning satellite transmitters that defendants wear on their belts. This is what they would wear while they're working or if they're away from home. Sergeant John Gard showed me how it works. He put a bracelet and transmitter on me, and we took a short drive around downtown Greenville. Oh, I see. Bird's eye view. Back at his office, guards showed me how the GPS tracked my course. The blue dots are my trail. That's how he can tell if a defendant has gone where he shouldn't go, like to the victim's home or workplace. And what's in the red box? Date, time, speed. So far, the new system's been a success. Advocates say it could have saved Anitra Coburn and others like her. But there's still no guarantee officers can respond fast enough to stop an abuser. It's not the magic bullet. And, and see, I think in domestic violence, we want to find that magic bullet. I don't have it. Neither does anybody else in the state. 
Some lawmakers see real bullets as a possible solution. The legislature passed a bill in 2005 that requires court clerks to give victims the information on how to apply for a temporary concealed weapon permit when they get a domestic violence protective order. And I'm a firm believer that uh, knowledge is power. I believe that uh, knowing your options and, and feeling strong about yourself makes a big difference in whether you're a victim or not. But victims advocates say the new law is like telling the victim you're on your own. In all the years I've done this work, it's the worst legislation I've ever seen. Advocates say there's no guarantee a victim will be able to purchase a weapon or know how or when to use it. So far, few victims have taken advantage of the new law. They're reluctant to have anything in the house, either around themselves or their children, that could be used by their aggressor, by the person who's been abusing them, against them. Anitra Coburn had a gun, but Doug Carter took it from her and used it to kidnap her. If we finally have a great opportunity where a clerk in the state of North Carolina, a clerk of court, is going to provide a victim with valuable information, why don't we put on their information about where to get help? That's starting to happen in some courthouses, including Wake County's. The House of Representatives in 2004, the General Assembly passed a broad package of domestic violence reforms. Among other things, it gave police the power to arrest people who violate domestic violence protective orders, essentially bringing the violation of a civil order into criminal court. The legislation that was passed a couple of years ago was great, but it only goes halfway. Romery and other advocates say laws need to be tougher. If I go home tonight and I hit my wife in the face, I'm guilty of a class A1 misdemeanor. If I come to your property and I steal pine straw from you, I'm guilty of a class H felony. Is that right? Is, is that right? I mean, is there any, any way that we can justify those sorts of things? No. Domestic violence protective order. Advocates say that penalties for violating protective orders need to be tougher and bonds for abusers like Doug Carter need to be higher. This was somebody who was out to possess somebody. He was out to control her and when he was not able to control her and possess her, he killed her. A piece of paper in this regard did nothing. What he needed to have done to him was he needed to be kept in jail uh, under a massive bond. Let's set his bond at 1500 secured. In some courthouses, Let's advocates contact. now assess the risk of a defendant killing a victim for their bond hearing. But there's no database for that information or the conditions of bonds and protective orders that law enforcement officers can access. So an officer in the field that may go by that house and see the woman unconscious doesn't even know there's a protective order because he can't get that information from our computer system. May not even know that this is the fourth time. It's assault on a female. The technology is available to change that. And it really sickens me. I have seen too many people harmed, too many people hurt. I have seen too much blood, far too much, and too many senseless deaths to see in action Things that can be done so cheaply not be done at all, and that really hurts me. Advocates say judicial officials and law enforcement officers need training in handling domestic violence cases. And how they had their training in the academy is you mediate, separate, and clear. If the victim didn't want to prosecute, you didn't prosecute. You kind of did your best to put a Band-Aid on it. Guard says his officers now treat domestic violence cases like any other criminal case. Advocates say prosecutors need to do the same. There is this old-fashioned belief that domestic violence is just a, a family problem. It's a private issue, and it's not something that the state needs to get involved in. Advocates say more training and education beginning in our state's public schools will help people understand that domestic violence is everyone's problem. As long as the people who can create that culture do not create that culture, they have blood on their hands. Law enforcement already been out there. The Anitra Coburn case inspired the Pitt County Sheriff's Department to create a domestic violence unit and train all its officers in how to handle such cases. The Douglas Carter and Anitra Coburn case. John Gard urges legislators to support more domestic violence reform and is trying to get money to expand his unit in Pitt County. I get asked, you know, what's, what's your drive? I have two daughters. You know, I have two daughters. That's my drive. You know, if you look at the numbers, is there a fair probability that they could be a victim of domestic violence? Yes.
Dad? Next, Doug Carter survived his suicide attempt. What explanation does he have for killing Anitra Coburn? You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, go to WRAL.com and click on News. Ten years ago, Doug Carter killed Anitra Coburn here in cold blood. A court order could not protect her. Anitra's case and those of hundreds of other victims remind us that preventing domestic violence takes a lot more than a piece of paper. That's a shot. That is a shot. Doug Carter survived the shotgun blast he aimed at his head. Prosecutors allowed him to plead guilty to second degree murder and first degree kidnapping. A judge sentenced him to 29 years. Anitra's mother filed a civil suit against Carter to add to his punishment and keep him from profiting off any book or movie deals. I knew I'd never get a dime. I mean, I didn't do it to get money. I didn't want blood money, you know. For, I didn't want to get rich off my child's death. She wanted to make a statement about domestic violence. So did a jury. In 1998, it awarded her $525 million. At the time, it was the largest civil damage award in U.S. history. This was a way to put him under civilly a life sentence. He'll have this judgment over his head for the rest of his life. Now, it is Doug Carter who is the hostage. I was really obsessed with her, really in love with her, where I felt like I wasn't a person without her being around. Anybody who, who's having any kind of problems, mentally or physically, abusing their spouse, they need to get help, because they could end up like me. And here, all I've done is wasted a lot of people's lives. And it doesn't just affect one person. What's done is already done, and I can't change what's happened. I wish I could. I wish I could be in the grave instead of her. But I can't. This ain't no life right here, being in prison. I got to walk around like this all the time. He means like this. He looks too good. He looks too good. He needs to look worse. I don't have much faith in that word closure. Nothing closes. <clears throat> Nothing closes. I don't feel like anything's closed. My wounds are gapped wide open. Anitra did not die in vain. She did not. Her death was not in vain. It has uh, been the catalyst for change, both here in this county, but, but the state is, as, as well. And, you know, we're going to make a difference, every one of us.